let me begin with a disclaimer. My real specialty is in the 17th century and in the American South, and that's where my training lies. Um, although I have expanded from there into indigenous histories sort of across time uh, and across the North American continent. So why am I speaking about a topic based in Northern Canada and Northern Quebec? Uh, two reasons. Number one, I'm currently writing a big picture synthesis of Native American environmental history from the first human habitation to the present and from Oaxaca to the Arctic Circle. And that certainly includes Northern Quebec in the late 20th and 21st centuries. So this is just a teeny bit of a later chapter, uh, about three chapters down the road from the one I'm currently writing. Uh, so it is part of a current research project. Um, James Bay is uh, the kind of the southern bay off of Hudson Bay, and it lies just south of the Arctic Circle. Uh, the territory inhabited by the Cree is known as Yayu Itzchi. Um, James Bay is obviously an English name. And James Bay actually um, exemplifies a lot of the themes I'm uh, developing for the latter part of this book. Uh, the second reason that I wanted to speak on this subject is that it's personal uh, to me in particular, but also to most of you in this room, because it's a story in which millions of people in the northeastern United States play an active role. I first became aware of this. I first became aware of this in 1999 when my family moved to Plattsburgh, New York, directly on the border with Quebec uh, to take a position at the State University of New York there. And uh, there were many pleasant surprises about living there, one of which was super low electricity rates in the city of Plattsburgh. And so I asked around and found out that this was because the city of Plattsburgh had a long-term contract with something called Hydro-Quebec, uh, a public utility that um, monopolizes the production of power in the province of Quebec and indeed, I found out on further investigation, produces 99% of all of its power from hydroelectric. Um, I further discovered the following spring in the year 2000 that one of the reasons uh, for the cheap electrical rates from Hydro-Quebec was that their reach was so long that much of their power came from the northern parts of Quebec uh, between 1,000 and 1,500 kilometers north of Montreal from the eastern shores of James Bay. The way I discovered this was that the year 2000 was the 10th anniversary of something called the Voyage of the Odiac, which was a um, concerted political demonstration by Cree people in the year 1990 to uh, dramatize some of the environmental damage that had been done by uh, power projects in northern Quebec in their homeland and to try to prevent an expansion of hydroelectric projects in northern Quebec. So they took this sort of canoe kayak brigade all the way down from Hudson Bay, uh, Lake Ontario, um, uh, the St. Lawrence River, the Champlain Valley, the Hudson River, and ended up with a big demonstration at Manhattan on Earth Day in 1990. So I kind of noticed that and learned a lot more just from local news coverage of this event. But we're connected here as well. This is an image of, uh, a, that's about three years out of date of uh, the Hydro-Quebec grid, which as is typical for this room, doesn't show up that well with the light here. But um, here's the province of Quebec in white and the yellow power lines um, are, uh, show transmission lines within Quebec. So here's James Bay um, kind of in the top left and then all the way down to Montreal, which at James Bay is known as the South. And then these power lines keep going uh, further south. So for example, there are two cables buried in the length of Lake Champlain, which divides New York and Vermont, um, running down to New York and branching out to Southern New England. There are other ones that run through Northern Maine and down here. Um, and this, as I said, is out of date. If you want updates, try running a, a Google News Alert for Hydro-Quebec. And one of the things that you'll find, maybe you already know this if you live in New Hampshire, but one of the things you'll find is that Hydro-Quebec is trying to put a major new transmission line uh, right down the length of New Hampshire as well. So several years later, I was attending a conference at the McCord Museum in Montreal, uh, not so far from the Hydro-Quebec headquarters. It was called uh, Quebec Environmental History in the wider world. And at this 
conference, each session paired people who were doing original research in Quebec's environmental history with people like myself who were doing related research outside of the province of Quebec. And to me, the most interesting panel was one that focused on um, environmental change in society at James Bay during the era of the uh, James Bay, Hydro-Quebec's James Bay project from 1975 forward. So I won't go into the details of what the panelists had to say, but what interested me most was the Q&A period afterwards. A gentleman came down the stairs to my left. He was carrying this enormous stack of papers. He had a button-down shirt with a pocket protector and, and mechanical pencils and everything. And I was sitting next to a friend who um, is very much plugged in to both Anglophone and Francophone um, society in Quebec. And she leaned over and she said, Jim, you're about to learn a lot about Quebec. So this man, of course, was a representative of Hydro-Quebec. And he uh, took issue with some of what had been said about his employer's activities in northern Quebec. And uh, part of what he wanted to do was to balance the, you know, uh, balance the account by explaining all of the benefits that um, the damming of rivers and creation of hydroelectric project, uh, electric projects on Cree, land, Cree Indian land had brought to the Cree people. And so, you know, he started out kind of slow with schools and this sort of thing, a uh, road going in. But with each enumeration of, 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 of these benefits, 232 cable TV channels, for example, he got more excited, his voice rose, he rose on his toes. And then finally, at the end, keep in mind this is Quebec, Francophone province, finally at the end, he was standing on his toes and jabbing his finger in the air and saying, before we went in there, those people didn't even speak French. So I was hooked. Um, several years later, I got a Canadian government grant to uh, research a new course on First Nations of Canada. And I used a big chunk of that grant to go to James Bay. Uh, to the town formerly known as Fort Rupert, now as, as Wiscaganish. It's at the mouth of the Rupert River, one of the southernmost rivers in the James Bay region. And I won't go into uh, too much of what I saw there um, because I only have 40 minutes, um, but it was absolutely fascinating and eye-opening. And one of the things that really blew me away was this river. So this is taken with my cheap little camera out of the window of my Air Quebec plane. Um, and uh, uh, we're at the mouth of the river, looking up the Rupert River. Here's the little town of Wiscaganish, I think about 4,500 people at the time. And this river is magnificent. It's just everything you think of when you think of a great northern river. Fast, cold, deep, um, full of fish, uh, full of life. A little over a year later, I was on my one hour commute to work and I was listening to a, a radio station in Quebec called Rock des Temps Sans Doucette. It, it was great for me because they had a strong signal and they enunciated, and you know, everyone, they're all in newscasters, enunciated very clearly. Um, good if you're learning French, and even if you speak French but not a Quebecois dialect, um, it's very useful. So I was listening to the radio station and it was just drive time stuff where they would usually play a little Celine Dion, tell you about a local, a local auto accident, have an advertisement for the local mall, just you know, pretty much the same news you'd have on the other side of the border. And, but for some reason this time, there was a gentleman from Hydro-Quebec. And it was a very anodyne, bland conversation. The, um, uh, uh, the radio announcer was asking him questions about, well, how is Hydro-Quebec um, doing? And he would say, well, we're doing great, and we're doing great things for the province. But he didn't mention anything in particular. And I thought, that's kind of weird. Uh, and then I realized a few days later, that this coincided with essentially the shutting down of the Rupert River, that magnificent river that I'd visited the year before. So this is the Rupert River before. Um, this is part of a project that was designed to redirect 50% of the flow of the Rupert River into the rivers to the north, mainly a river called the East Main and the La Grande River. So, so as to um, increase the flow of those rivers so they could be run through turbines to generate more electricity. So where does all this come from? Let me go back a little bit to before even I was born, um, the late 50s, early 60s, or even before that. Um, James Bay, uh, Eastern James Bay is 
a territory covering a, a series of river basins covering a little over 300,000 square kilometers with a population today of a little over 30,000 people. And um, for hundreds of generations, uh, mostly Cree and some Inuit people had developed highly adaptive ways of living on this land. Uh, now, these, these ways included having a pretty low population, and, uh, uh, but really these were persistent ways. And even after the arrival of Europeans who um, created a fort, a uh, trading post at Fort Rupert, West Kaganish, in uh, 1670, even with the arrival of Europeans, um, things didn't go on exactly as before, but this wasn't a situation where European colonists came and sort of got rid of all native people and replaced them with um, European and African people, right? This was, a this was more of a trading colonial relationship uh, in which these fur trading outfits like the Hudson's Bay Company really needed native people in situ um, with their local knowledge in order to tap into the uh, riches of the fur trade. This persisted well into the 20th century. This region actually wasn't a part of Quebec until the very end of the uh, 1800s and the beginning of the 1900s, when a federal law, um, basically by fiat, made it part of Quebec. And Quebec's, uh, the provincial government's response for the first couple of generations for the bulk of the 20th century was to try not to govern too much there, to try to have the federal government finance um, uh, essentially the expenses of, uh, of, of, of supporting and negotiating with the indigenous communities in northern Quebec. It wasn't until a later date that they got interested. And they got interested in part because of a company called Hydro-Quebec. Down south, in the 1930s and the 1940s, the um, power industry in Quebec was a mess. I mean, there were all these competing companies that hadn't consolidated. There were all of these efficiencies. Uh, they were um, you know, providing terrible service at, at really high rates, which is strange because hydro, you know, Quebec is full of, water, of waterways. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's hydroelectric heaven. So um, in the 1940s, a number of these uh, corporations were nationalized and consolidated, uh, beginning with the largest one, Montreal Light, Heat, and Power. And the new sort of mega company was named Hydro-Quebec uh, as of 1944. Fast forward about 15 years uh, to the very beginning of the 1960s, and something new was underway, uh, something that's known uh, now as Quebec Quiet Revolution. In a nutshell, this was a francophone first, modernizing, secularizing, um, economic nationalist, cultural nationalist movement designed to give the francophone majority in the province of Quebec, about 80% at the time, um, political power. Much of the political and economic power in Quebec had been exercised by Anglophones and, and also by people from the United States. So the movement, uh, among other things, um, included a series of uh, language laws designed to make French the official language of the province, um, so that rather than being a barrier to participation, for uh, Francophones, uh, the French language would be their entry point into it and a barrier to Anglophones. So um, one of the mottos of uh, Jean Lesage, the first uh, uh, premier of Quebec um, during what is known as the Quiet Revolution, was um, uh, uh, it's time for a change. Okay? And this was everywhere on postcards and everything. Um, Jean Lesage, as the first, pre uh, as the first kind of modern premier of Quebec, had as his minister of natural resources a fellow named René Lévesque, or in Québécois, Lévesque. Uh, and uh, if, if you've been to Montreal, there, you've, you've seen, you know, there's a, a metro station, there's a, a major street name for him, and so forth. So as minister of natural resources, René Lévesque was pushing the premier to go further with the nationalization of uh, public power. And um, uh, the premier was kind of reluctant, but finally agreed to call a new election prematurely in 1962, which would essentially be a referendum on um, the further nationalization and uh, 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 expansion of hydroelectric provinces uh, projects in Quebec. So uh, this is um, a very famous uh, political poster or a campaign poster that was used. It's uh, now or never, masters in our own house, 
the greatest reservoir in the world uh, is, is among us in Quebec. Um, uh, it's the electricity that lights our homes and our farms. It's also the electricity that's the source of energy for uh, workshops, uh, uh, job makers. Um, we must be com uh, completely uh, complete owners of this source of energy uh, uh, to um, advance the best interests of Quebec. And only the uh, uh, Liberal Party in Quebec um, has really committed itself to this project, which in bold letters will be the key to the kingdom. And I don't know if you can tell, but the key on the left um, has the fleur de lis a symbol of Quebecois nationalism, uh, and it points directly towards the name Liberal Party, uh, and it has a lightning bolt running down the middle. A sort of a francophone trial run at managing a major hydroelectric project was actually kind of underway, underway um, uh, at a, an, a part of Quebec known as the North Shore on the Manicougan River, or La Manique. And uh, this was kind of a medium-large project, uh, the first dam of which is depicted here, that um, was large enough to be kind of a big deal, or to be a, a kind of a, a showpiece for um, the new Quebec but small enough that mostly uh, francophone engineers and employees and so forth could be um, in charge. And this actually became a, a cultural icon. There was a sports car, uh, La Manique. Um, there was a song uh, by the uh, old crooner Georges Dor, and it was later um, covered by uh, Leonard Cohen, and more recently by a, a fellow named Bruno Pelletier. Um, when Bruno Pelletier sang this song in Montreal, just a couple of years ago, I have a YouTube clip of this. He started out just with the first, you know, the first bar, and then everyone in the audience could sing the song. Uh, when I played this at an earlier presentation in, in Sherbrooke, kind of near this francophone area in the heart of Quebec, um, people were swaying back and forth in the audience, you know, old and young. So this was this cultural phenomenon. It's not just about cheap power. It's about the power of the Quebecois people as a people. Okay, well, um, in 1970, a new premier was elected named Robert Bourassa. Uh, he was from the Liberal Party um, as opposed to the new Parti Québécois. Now, the difference was that the Parti Québécois was very much centered on Québécois nationalism, but also even separatism. And the Liberal Party under Bourassa was highly nationalistic, but within the existing constitutional framework of Quebec within a confederated Canada. So um, Barassa, as uh, someone who was being opposed by uh, the separatists led by René Lévesque, the uh, minister who had really pushed for uh, this, this new election in 1962, um, Barassa, having to sort of show his nationalist credentials, um, did so really fervently, sort of like a, a Democrat today, pushing harder for military expansion than a Republican might. It's that sort of dynamic. Uh, so uh, under Ross's uh, tenure as premier, for example, the first, really, uh, the first language law that really had teeth in it was passed, uh, Bill 22 in 1974. And in 1971, Barassa made this an announcement to much fanfare in Quebec City that at last he was going to open the north, that at last northern Quebec would be part of Quebec. He really emphasized a fusion of nature, nation, not meaning a political nation, but rather a people, uh, a fusion between nature, nation, and economic development. So he basically had the 1970 equivalent of a laser light show uh, with dry ice and the whole deal. And at the end, uh, there was this, this, this pronouncement, the world begins today. So the world began the next year, in 1971, at least the world as envisioned by Bourassa, um, with uh, the construction of a road running from Montreal to um, the Le Grand River, uh, sort of two-thirds the way up um, the eastern shore of, of James Bay, uh, the place that was going to be the real focus of the first major uh, series of dams, four enormous dams, as we'll see, uh, 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 that were going to produce massive amounts of hydroelectricity. Um, in 1973, dam construction began on the Le Grand, 
um, almost immediately, Cree people stepped in because there was a funny thing. In this big announcement about the James Bay Project in Quebec City in 1971, there was no mention of the people who lived at James Bay. By the way, there was also no environmental impact statements, none of that foolishness, okay? Um, it, was a, it was a very different time. And in fact, the way the Cree people of James Bay learned about this was that this man, Philip Owashish, who had been to school in the South, um, I believe at Concordia University, I could be wrong about that, but anyway, uh, he, was, he was in a, kind of a, a town in the southeastern corner of the James Bay region, closest to Montreal, and he picked up a day-old copy of a Montreal newspaper that had covered this big announcement by Barassa, and that's how they found out. He and a couple of other young men who had experience in the South, who were pretty uh, fluent in French and or English and kind of knew the system, then uh, went to James Bay, went around to uh, you know, various communities. They talked to the elders, they talked to the trappers, they talked to the hunters to see how they, uh, the communities wanted to deal with this existential threat to their, to their land. Um, so in 1973, uh, these three and others organized a um, legal challenge uh, to uh, the dam construction that was beginning. Uh, it, the court was in Montreal, and the idea was that, that these hearings would last about a week to see if they could get an injunction against the work on the dam. It went on for something like 167 days. It went on for about six months. And the main reason for this was that both sides, both the province and Hydro-Quebec and the Cree uh, people, had a lot of information to share. On the, on, the, on the company provincial side, it was technical information, and on the Cree side, it was cultural information. The, um, the uh, province in Hydro-Quebec uh, you know, had been forced to recognize that there were people at James Bay, took as their strategy to say, well, they're just like anyone else in Quebec. They have no special rights, they have no special privileges, and in fact, they will benefit at least as much as anyone else from uh, all of these jobs that are being created. On the Cree side, um, witness after witness came forward, um, unable to speak French or English, uh, and made it very clear that these are Aboriginal people, these are Indigenous people, and they're not living like people in suburban Montreal. Uh, so the judge, after all of that, granted an injunction against construction, which the province's Supreme Court overturned a week later, which might make you sad, but they also, uh, the Supreme Court also enjoined um, the province and Hydro-Quebec to uh, negotiate with the Cree Nation. And so the result of this was two years later, later um, the JBNQA, <laughs> James Bay and Northern Quebec Agreement, um, a vast agreement that is extremely complicated, but um, essentially created different categories of land on which different parties, including Cree and Inuit people, would have different use rights. Uh, it did open the La Grande River to hydroelectric exploitation. It also gave a lot of money um, especially to the Crees, and uh, uh, gave them a lot of autonomy over how to use it and how to create for the first time sort of quasi-governmental and eventually truly governmental structures. Okay, I'm going to say a word about that in a minute, but first I'd like to observe that the very next year, in 1976, um, the Parti Québécois came to power, the, the um, separatist party under René Lévesque. And um, it, Lévesque was premier from 1976 to 1985. These are the years when the bulk of the work was done on the La Grande River dam and, and, and turbine projects. And it's not coincidental that these are also the years in which um, the first big push for a provincial refer uh, a random referendum on whether to uh, 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 start negotiating for Quebec independence and sovereignty began, and that election was held in 1980. Um, it fell, 60% uh, of the people voted against it, but 40% uh, of the people voted for it, and so sovereignists were encouraged enough to kind of keep the idea up in the air for quite some time. So these are not a coincidence. The idea of uh, political sovereignty for the Quebecois people and the idea of having this massive showpiece project that would fuel industry and everything uh, coming from the north, these are of a piece. But of course, as these dams were built, as the roads were built, um, uh, Yayu Ichi was transformed in many ways. Of course, much of it was underwater on the La Grande River, but the roads also made a huge difference. I mean, if you think about it, each of those roads 
um, through kind of low-lying, I didn't really describe the topography here, but a sort of low-lying country, boreal forest, water everywhere where you don't expect it. So building roads through this kind of landscape completely transforms the hydrology of the region. Um, uh, the roads also brought in logging trucks. They brought in mining companies and so forth. Um, now, the Crees actually had some capacity to do something about this because uh, the 1975 agreement um, recognized a, a uh, an overall government for the Cree people, the Grand Council for, of the Cree, and it created a number of sort of what we call, um, uh, well, essentially government agencies, Cree-run school boards um, and Cree-run enterprises such as a little airline called Air Quebec and so forth. But there was a problem with implementation because, for example, these logging companies would come in and totally break the rules and the Cree nation couldn't do much about it. They had these outstanding lawsuits, something like 18 as of 2002, um, uh, that were just dragging on in courts down in Montreal or in Quebec City. And of course, these are courts that are very much um, creatures of the very government um, you know, industry alliance between Hydro-Quebec that, that, that the Cree were trying to fight against. So, especially because of these environmental problems and these, uh, 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 the lack of follow-through on the part of Hydro-Quebec and the provincial government and some of the key provisions of the 1975 agreement, um, in the mid-1980s, when uh, the provincial government decided that they wanted an, a whole new phase of the James Bay project on a more northerly river called the Great Whale River, Crees really dug in their heels. Now, interestingly, um, this new effort um, this great whale project was also the project of Robert Bourassa, who came back to power in 1985 and stayed in, in power until 1994 when he resigned um, due to terminal cancer. So uh, the very first year of his second term, uh, in 1986, serious planning began to do to the Great Whale River what had been done to the Grand River. As I said, the resistance kicked in very quickly. Um, this canoe brigade that I described from 1990 um, did a lot to, to um, publicize the Cree's uh, efforts outside of the province. Um, it's uh, what's often been called the politics of shame, and it was just perfected in this particular instance. So much so that two years later, um, New York State pulled out of a huge contract with Hydro-Quebec. They canceled the contract and thus made the, con uh, the whole effort to uh, dam the Great Whale River financially um, unworkable. And so in 1994, uh, the province in Hydro-Quebec abandoned the pro uh, project and those dams have never been built to this day. Well, as I said, Barassa stepped down in 1994 because he was terminally ill. Um, a new election had to be held and his successor was uh, Jacques Parizeau, who was a Parti Québécois uh, 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 leader. Um, so again, a, a na a, like, like Barassa, a separatist, but unlike him, a nationalist. He campaigned on a promise to hold another referendum to uh, 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 separate Quebec from Canada. And uh, this was held in 1995. It lost by an incredibly slim margin, by a fraction of a percent. And uh, in fact, the massive turnout by First Nations people, especially the Cree, uh, was a significant part of the margin of difference between yes and no on this, on this referendum. And so too was sympathy for the Cree thanks to this politics of shame and earlier bad publicity for Hydro-Quebec, so too was uh, sympathy for the Cree among Liberal Party nationalists, who in the absence of this history uh, that had been unfolding before them in Quebec's north, um, might have been uh, uh, more uh, friendly to the Parti Québécois initiative to separate from Canada. But as with the earlier referendum in 1980, I think we can't really separate plans for the Great Whale expansion and the 1990 referendum, because even though they took place under the auspices of two distinctly different political parties, those parties and their leaders were very much linked by their common ground of Quebecois nationalism, where both parties, uh, the Great Whale Project, was part of a national francophone project. So I said the Great Whale Project didn't go through, but um, a different uh, uh, agreement did. In 1994, uh, sorry, 2000, the uh, La Paix de Brave, uh, also known as the New Relationship Agreement, was signed between the Grand Council of the Cree 
and um, the uh, Parti Québécois government of Bernard Landry. Um, this was a very different agreement from the 1975 agreement. It was less rushed. It was based on a long experience and adaptation to the Hydro-Quebec uh, 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 company in northern Quebec. And, um, you know, it was on the part, uh, you know, on, the, on the Quebec side, I mean, I'm not sorry, on the Cree side, uh, these are people who had really, really learned how to deal with the outside world in the intervening uh, almost 20 years. So the preamble to this agreement made it clear that this was a nation-to-nation -nation agreement. Think how different this is from the original um, you know, announcement in 1971 um, by, by Barassa's government that basically ignored the fact that there were Cree people up there. And now there's actually kind of a nation-to-nation -nation, uh, agreement. It's explicitly nation-to-nation. -nation. That's not kind of. Um, this, in brief, uh, created this sort of shell game with water that I described earlier, whereby the half of the Rupert River's flow was redirected to northern rivers to generate, uh, to, to run through generators up there. Um, it also included revenue sharing. Um, it included uh, joint management of logging, mining, and hydroelectric company, uh, activities uh, in um, eastern James Bay. And it included a minimum of $70 million a year of direct payments to the Crees, a minimum but adjusted upwards uh, depending on how the mining was going, depending on how uh, all of these uh, economic enterprises were going. So clearly, all of this tells us quite a bit about Quebec. Um, my book will really focus more on the Cree story than this talk has, but it also could, if I had another few days, <laughs> tell us a lot about um, the Cree's experiences. Just a couple of quick examples, though, of how this is a distinctly Quebec story. Um, René Lévesque said in 1984, towards the end of his long um, tenure as Premier of Quebec, Hydro-Quebec has remained at once the engine and the mirror of the awakening and rise of Francophone Quebec. Um, this is reflected in the location, actually, of Hydro-Quebec's headquarters in Montreal. Uh, guess what street it's on? <laughs> René Lévesque. Um, and uh, uh, also the uh, French branch of uh, the Cl uh, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, the CBC, is, is on René Lévesque. Um, I think, though, there's an even larger context to this fusion that Lévesque was talking about between Hydro-Quebec's and uh, Québécois interests. Uh, there's actually a set of corporations, Quebec-based corporations, that are, whose futures are seen to be almost coterminous with that of the Quebecois people. That's a little bit of an exaggeration, but when one of them drops out or isn't doing well, um, it's a cultural crisis in a way. Um, so uh, these include the uh, media and printing conglomerate, uh, conglomerate Quebecor, um, and, uh, which is right there, um, and uh, Bombardier, maker of uh, jets and um, high-speed train engines and metro systems and so forth. So, you know, I've got the um, fleur de lis uh, next to a statue of René Lévesque, um, the Canadian flag kind of pointing towards uh, uh, Robert Barasta, who's a nationalist but wanted to stay within Canada. But really, in many ways, um, they're of a piece. Uh, you know, uh, these political leaders' words, their, their, their movements are of a piece with the support of uh, these um, corporations. Okay, so it's a Quebec story, it's a Cree story, but it's a little larger than that. It tells us about, a lot about larger extra-provincial forces that were, at, have been at work throughout the Americas for centuries and even beyond. I only have time for one example. I cut like three slides right before coming over. <laughs> but a good example is how stories are told about nations. The strong tendency of the nation state is to seek a union of peoplehood, I don't know, like the Red Sox nation, and um, uh, the polity within distinctly defined borders. New nations, you can talk about multicultural societies, but it can be very difficult to achieve. Um, so new nations have yet to fully establish that. Because they have yet to fully establish that, they often try harder. Quebec was not alone in um, developing a colonial territorial vision at its own moment of decolonization in the 1960s and 1970s. 
The United States did that a couple of centuries earlier. Canada did, did that roughly a century or earlier with the Confederation. So um, one of the common uh, motifs in these stories of a new nation uh, just getting started is a rhetoric of empty land and a rhetoric of a frontier whose conquest is going to make the nation unique and where the nation will fulfill its greatness. Um, it happens repeatedly in different countries, and yet it's always an exceptionalist narrative. It's an exceptionalism based on the idea of a vast, resource-rich, virgin wilderness, I have that in quotation marks in my notes, um, where the nation will find its destiny. In the United States, that was the West. In Quebec, that was the North. And in much of Canada, I should add, it's the North. Bourassa made this explicit in a 1972 speech. He said, James Bay, and this is a quotation, must be conquered. Like the Eastern pioneers have conquered the U.S. West, we must conquer these territories if we want them to truly belong to us. <clears throat> to bring it back to the Cree, though, it's a little provocative, but one writer has called what has happened within uh, Cree communities since the 1970s their own quiet revolution, their own sort of modernizing concerted effort to exert linguistically and culturally specific political power within a defined territory. The Cree, as is so often the case with indigenous people, have turned around um, the Western style forms of government and bureaucracy that were imposed upon them to their own purposes, to the purposes of sustaining traditional values, of sustaining communities and sustaining uh, ways of life. Very often this ha happens nowadays under the rubric of co-management. It happens uh, in, you know, all, throughout the Americas. It happens in the United States. It happens in Mexico. Uh, you know, one of the things I'm writing about is uh, uh, the Benito Juarez National Forest, uh, uh, in which there's kind of a co-management relationship between the Mexican, Mexican federal government and uh, uh, Zapotec communities within and around the forest. Sovereignty, a critical tool of the nation state, can also be used by the nations within. In Quebec, we have sovereignties within sovereignties. It's a little more complicated than most situations, but it's not an un entirely unusual one. We have Quebec within Canada, uh, the Cree nation within Quebec. As, um, as, as uh, Matthew Kuncombe said in 1994, he was really the leader of this politics of shame that got the Great Whale Project shut down. As he said in 1994, right before the second referendum on Quebec sovereignty, if Canada is divisible because of Quebec's right to self-determination, why then is Quebec not divisible as well? So are these competing sovereignties? Are these coexisting sovereignties? There's a huge confusing literature on this. Look up the name Martin Papillon, Marty Butterfly is his name. <laughs> um, but I would say that these sovereignties are, uh, Cree and Quebec sovereignties are now what social scientists would call mutually constitutive. They use the same rhetoric and they're used in relation, and they're invoked and created and continuously recreated in kind of a dialogue with each other. They each shape the other. So in conclusion, this is a Quebec story, it's a Pan-American story, and it's a story in which we in the Northeastern United States play a vital role as consumers in much of Southern New England. When you turn the light switch off or on, you're hooked into James Bay. Okay? So as consumers, and occasionally, as we saw, with uh, New York's nixing of the Great Whale Project in the 1990s as political actors. And I would not be surprised if in the future, um, with this new project coming through New Hampshire, you might be asked again to play a role as political actors. So, thank you. Thank you very much for a really stimulating talk. This is a little gift for you. Oh, thank you. I'd like to turn it to the audience for anybody who would like to ask a question. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Um, I just had a quick follow-up on what you were just saying, which is, can you say a little bit more about the relationship between how the Cree view the federal government? Are mm -hmm. they leveraging it against the Quebec? Absolutely. Yeah, I yeah. wanted more yeah. clarification. Um, yeah, so you know, when I've taught this, I've been so enthusiastic about all these intricacies, and my students are like, what, wait? <laughs> uh, because it's very complicated. Um, the, 
the Korea, of, as is very often the case, indigenous communities look to a federal government as opposed to the local guys as the lesser two evils, as I'm not necessarily their friends, but as less kind of an immediate threat. And so in the early 1970s, the Cree turned to the federal government. The one difficulty there was that the prime minister was Pierre Trudeau from the same party as Robert Bourassa, the premier of Quebec. And so um, they got some support, but Trudeau had to be a little careful. And he had to be a little careful because um, he had just taken a kind of a political risk in 1970 by invoking a War Powers Act, by essentially militarizing Quebec during something called the October Crisis of 1970, uh, when kind of a violent separatist movement known as the FLM had uh, uh, kidnapped um, a provincial um, minister and a British uh, diplomat and held them for months. The, the Quebec guy died. So um, they brought out thousands of federal troops. So, so Trudeau had to be doubly careful because he was from the same party as and for us, and because he'd already played a very strong hand in Quebec. Um, and so essentially the Cree were on their own in the 70s. But in other eras, uh, especially when you have different parties in power at the federal and provincial levels, then they've gotten a lot more help. So the Cree actually have um, what they treat pretty much as embassies um, in Quebec City and in Ottawa. So I don't know if that, yeah. I could say a lot more, but that's it, that's it in a nutshell. Any other questions? Given the fact that there have been a number of years since this second agreement that you, that you, that you talked about with the Cree, um, how has this one actually worked out in practice? Yeah, um, it's given the Cree, um, because of the co-management principle, it's, it's um, given them, uh, allowed them to play a stronger hand against timber companies and so forth. Uh, but at the same time, on that slide, if I go back a little bit here, um, it, it's further opened up the north to um, uh, resource extraction. It's, it's made it um, even more possible to treat the north as a sacrifice zone. And so, uh, you know, in the top left picture um, and in the central one, you can see the consequences of logging operations that are made possible by the, by the expanded network of roads. And, you know, these are not New England forests, which are actually, in relative terms, pretty resilient. Um, these are boreal forests where it's going to take generations to come back. Um, and it's uh, also made possible an expansion of mining. It's, uh, there's a coincidence here, too, with, with commodities markets and things like molybdenum and so forth. So um, it has had a definite downside, but, it's ha also, but at least you know, it's given the Crees more of a financial interest in um, and, and uh, um, management control over these new initiatives. The big threat, actually, now is um, something called the Plan Nord, the Northern Plan which is this really amorphous plan that um, keeps changing <laughs> depending on who's premier, but which successive premiers at Quebec have picked up and is essentially the James Bay Agreement and La Paix de Prave on steroids, that it really encompasses not just uh, northern Quebec, but you know, all of the Hudson Bay area. So uh, the story isn't over. It, you know, this is a marginally, this is a, no, not marginally, it is a distinctly better agreement than the 1975 agreement but it's also conceivable that there will be a much worse one in the future. It sounds like their own attitudes towards their environment has changed as they've become economically vested in these changes. That picture that you have there just really struck me as a sort of a, a level of deforestation that is, as you've mentioned, years to recover in a boreal forest yeah. that would have been jointly agreed upon, assume, presumably between the forestry crumpery and the Cree. So I'm wondering if, if your book is going to sort of explore how their own attitudes towards preservation and conservation has changed from a very sort of trapper fishing community to now one that is more of an extractionist community. Yeah. Um, well, I should say this is maybe 10 pages in manuscript of the book. It's, okay. you know, um, it's just, I, it's just such, I'm taking in so much time and space. I yeah. can't make it about this. And, and um, if anyone was interested, I could 
there's so much great literature on this whole subject, I could bury you with citations. Yeah. Um, and that is a central question. You know, how have Cree people changed? Have they changed in their hearts? Have they changed outwardly? Have they changed because they're forced to? Um, have they changed because actually the Cree and in, Inuit populations are actually grow, have grown substantially since 1975? Um, I can tell you from having visited there and staying in touch with people there and, you know, um, following this really impressive online presence that Cree people have, um, that, uh, that the solution to modern ills such as diabetes um, and, you know, drug use and suicide, teen suicide and uh, youth suicide and so forth is very often seen um, as going back into the bush. And so troubled youth are very often taken on the kind of trip that is special to them in the 2010s, but that would have been um, just another winter or just another summer if it were the year 1960. Mm -hmm. So there's the sense that, that the, the, the spiritual salvation and the spiritual taproot still of, of Cree life are to be found in the old ways. Okay, <laughs> one last question. Okay. Um, I just to follow up on that. That's another thing I was curious about was, especially when you had the three, uh, the three Cree, um, back a few slides, um, the three Cree who kind of were nego early negotiators, yeah, um, is which Cree are, I mean, you talk about this incredible influx of cash. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering when you're saying the Cree, I'm Absolutely. assuming there's different, my own experience in Native communities yeah. is that there's often a family or two that clamp onto uh -huh. the lever of, you know, levers of power when in negotiations with, out, you know, mm -hmm. outside governments. And I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more, you kind of hinted at it there about any social or, you know, uh, political divisions within that community as yeah. a result of, of all this. Well, it can be difficult to tell, um, partly because I'm an Anglo guy from California and not, uh, and partly because I haven't done the kind of immersive work that other outsiders have done, um, but also because um, uh, very often decisions are made and then voted on in consensus. So um, from the outside, what's pretty apparent is that, as is so often the case with indigenous communities, you have this group of people who by training and by inclination, and sometimes as a real sacrifice, don't spend their time in the bush. They do kind of give their lives to be in these absolutely vital intermediaries between their communities and the outer world, which makes it possible for the Cree Trappers Association to just go on and doing its work as closely as possible and fidelity to its old ways. Um, but of course, it's often the case with indigenous communities under pressure too that there are real hard feelings you know, it's dismissed as factionalism, but I see this as a natural resort, a result of facing absolutely desperate times, of facing existential threats. And I, I don't mean that, I don't say that lightly, truly existential threats and having riot, different ideas about what to do about it, having that same goal to survive this as a people, but having different ideas about what to do about it. And because the stakes are so high, really following but you don't see that so much as an outsider looking into Cree communities because what happens whenever there's some kind of referendum is that people talk about it, they decide, and then those who seem to be in the majority are the only ones who vote. <laughs> so you get these 90% votes, 90% votes. Um, so it's, this, it's a little opaque, I think. Well, thank you once again for a great talk. Thank you. I'm sure if you have any individual questions, you're welcome to come forward and uh, ask him. Um, hope to see you next week.